Hello everyone, I'm here with author Jay Wells. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm, I'm fantastic. So, for those who haven't heard of you, what can you tell us about your books? Well, uh, um, my first book, Red-Headed Stepchild, came out in 2009, so I've been published about seven years. Um, I'm best known for, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, that series, the Sabina Kane series, which was five books. And then the next series I worked on is the Prosperous War series, which started with the book Dirty Magic. Um, and that series is kind of like a cop show with magic in it. So mm -hmm. instead of um, criminals selling drugs or whatever, they sell addictive magic potions and the police are trying to, you know, break up the covens that sell the potions. Um, I also write the Meridian Six series, which is just, which is like a dystopian um, vampire series. And um, I've written romance and I've written horror. I've just put my hands on a lot of different things. So. And what drew, drew you to each of those individual genres? Well, I think over the years I've realized that um, I really am comfortable working um, with a, a metaphorical language system that's tied to the paranormal. And by that I mean, um, you know, you can read my books on one level, which is cool books about vampires and wizards and things like that, but usually those characters are metaphors for societal ills or, you know, vampires are wonderful metaphors for people who are narcissistic. <laughs> and um, so I think for me, part of the fun of writing is building new worlds and exploring our world through kind of the filter of bringing all these paranormal elements in, because I think it allows you to illuminate things that you can't when you're just talking about, say, addiction in a straightforward manner. If you can add magic in there, it kind of adds new layers to the conversation. And I think in general, that's what fantasy does very, very well, um, is that you can read it on those multiple levels. So that's what's fun for me about it. Yeah, I as I read Dirty Magic, I noticed that the Kate Prospero was very layered. It's like she was certainly she was badass, but she was flawed at the same time. Like she's she's taking care of her younger brother Danny, and yet she has this this kind of uh, dark past. So I, I'm curious, what drew you to um, give her this, this this brother figure that she sort of has to take care of now that, that her parents are gone? Well, so, some of the reason for that comes from my own life. Um, when I was very young, my mother was a cop. She was a, actually a police reserve officer. Um, and this was from when I was about three until about five. And during that time, my parents th went through a divorce. So she actually was, you know, raised, you know, learning how to be a single mom and also going out at night and fighting crime, literally. Um, and during the day, she was a bookseller. And so my joke is that you take a bookseller slash cop and she gives birth to a daughter who writes about cops and magic. Um, <laughs> so um, part of it was just kind of exploring the challenges of being a woman and having that, the demands of being nurturing and being a role model to kids, but also the challenges of, you know, going to that dark side and how do you reconcile having to be a positive influence while you're also dealing with the, kind of the worst parts of society. And I think that's a really interesting character to write is um, her kind of moral conund conundrums that she get, get, gets into because of those situations. Also, I think um, I wanted to write about it just because it's not something we see very much in fiction. Uh, it is women who, you, know, you see plenty of women who are like the kick-ass women, and you see women who are, you know, sort of domestic, but you don't really see a lot of women who are straddling the line between the two and trying to do the best that they can. So that was one of the reasons. Yeah, I, I thought she was a really cool character. I, kind of along the same lines as um, Kate Beckett from uh, Cath The Castle Show. I, mm -hmm. I, very... Uh, flawed but at the same time she's very good at what she does um so what can you tell me about the sabina kane uh character well uh, sabina 
um, is also very, very flawed. I guess I like writing flawed women, um, but I like writing flawed characters in general. I think they're the most interesting. Um, Sabina, okay, so for those who haven't read that series, Sabina is half mage and half vampire in a world where vampires and mages are natural enemies. And so she kind of starts out, you know, kind of screwed. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't really fit in. Um, and she was raised by her vampire grandmother, who's one of the leaders of the vampire race, who um, trained her to be an assassin. So she's kind of an enforcer who keeps vampires who break the laws in line. Um, but in the first book, she's approached by a mage who um, she who kind of brings her into the mage world and she starts learning how things work there and she realizes they aren't as evil as she was taught to believe. Um, so that series is, it is on one hand kind of this action adventure story about her going out and, and fighting and, you know, people are trying to kill her and, you know, all these crazy action scenarios, but kind of at a deeper level thematically that series is about her trying to find balance between her two natures um, and also learning how to go from being this loner, very broken person who doesn't trust anyone to um, gathering a family of her choice around her and learning to trust people. So, and I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a hard series to describe, I think, because you know, on one hand, there's there's a lot of action and violence and dark themes, but then there's also a lot of comedy in it. There's romance in it. It's just, I think it's, that series is definitely kind of what I would consider the prototypical urban fantasy, um, what a lot of people think of when yeah. they think about, you know, the heyday of urban fantasy. That series encompasses pretty much everything that I think a lot of people define that age of urban fantasy as, so... And what what do you like in urban fantasy as far as, like, when you watch something on TV or read a, another book? Uh, I think world building is, for all urban fantasy, kind of the linchpin. Um, you know, every, every author, every writer on TV um, sort of blends genres differently in urban fantasy. Some lean more towards like a thriller based urban fantasy some have more horror based some have a heavy romance influence um some are more classical fantasy stories but the thing that ties them all together is that you're laying world building on top of our world as opposed to traditional fantasy where you're writing a whole you're creating a whole different universe basically uh, they call it a second world um story but with urban fantasy you're taking modern day chicago or los angeles and you're saying what would these cities look like if vampires live there or wizards live there or whatever and i think it creates all these really interesting scenarios in the stories and it's fun to see how every author takes the existing folklore and canon of all these paranormal beings and puts them in a contemporary setting and, and says how would these change if it, if they existed today um, so that's what's fun for me to watch and read. Uh, absolutely, I, I agree. It's like uh, when I, I like the underworld movies, and they they're kind of along the same lines too. Uh, having vampires in the modern world fighting werewolves, and um, I I really think the the covers on especially on the Dirty Magic books uh, are really cool. How did you go about getting those designed, and who who designed them? Well, I have to say, I was really blessed by the cover gods. Um, the, there is a wonderful creative director at my publisher named Lauren Panapinto, and she basically um, is responsible for the direction of all of my covers. Um, she works with uh, designers to do the photography and then do the artwork, and um, she uh, kind of oversees the whole aesthetic. One cool thing about uh, the Prosperous War series covers is, um, let's see, I've got Dirty Magic. Oh, you're not going to see it. Um, <laughs> on the Dirty Magic cover, there is an alchem alchemical set, and there's a palmistry hand and, like, a skull and a bunch of really cool props. And those are actually Lawrence. She brought them to the shoot. 
Oh, um, really? Put them on the cover. I mean, that's that's a committed creative director who wants to put her own personal things in there. Um, but we work together really well. I create Pinterest boards for all of my books. Um, in the developmental stage, and so I sent Lauren to those Pinterest boards and said, here's the aesthetic of the world, um, and she took that and ran with it, and we conferred on things like, if you look at each of the covers for Dirty Magic, Curse Moon, and Deadly Spells, you'll notice there's graffiti in the background on the walls and little things kind of hidden in the back. Those all tie into the story. And um, what was neat was I would I would email Lauren and say, okay, the theme of this this book, because each book is based on a different alchemical process. So I'd say this this book's theme is the alchemical process of dissolution. And I would send her the alchemical symbols for that, and she would put it in the graffiti in the background and things. So it was kind of a neat collaboration, but I really can't take any credit for how great they look because, you know, they, they took it and ran with it, and I couldn't be happier with the way they turned out. Yeah, I I, I think they're really neat. I, I'd say you definitely lucked out. Uh, do you feel like they captured the essence of what you pictured in your mind when you were writing her? Absolutely, although I will say this is a funny little thing. Um, originally, I had Kate as a blonde. It was, I mean, it wasn't something I felt really strongly about. It just, when I was writing my draft, she was blonde. And um, then Lauren emailed me when she was trying to do the cover, and she said, I can't find any models that fit what I picture Kate as, as who, who are blonde. Like, could she be brunette? And I said, absolutely, she could be blue, brunette, no problem. And she found this model who now is Kate to me. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of a neat case where... You know, my designer kind of knew my character <laughs> so well that yeah. she's like, I think she's brunette. So that worked out. And um, how much research did you have to do on both, not only the magical side as far as potions and everything else that goes into that, and then on the other hand, you've also got police and detective work. Yeah, I had to do a lot of research. Um, for the alchemical side, I knew very little about alchemy. Um, so I started with the book, like, Alchemy for Dummies, <laughs> you know, like, just very basic, you know, because I didn't even know, I, I mean, just even the basic concepts to be able to know what to research. So I started there, and then I started getting into books like um, Anatomy of the Psyche by Edward Edinger, who was a student of Carl Jung's, um, and that was a, a much weightier work where he took each of the alchemical processes and um, showed how they relate to psych psychological processes that people go to um, and how all the symbols and things really um, can be tied to the process of differentiation that a human goes through as they become an adult. Um, and so I thought that was really cool. So I was like, well, that's where the idea of each book having being based on a different alchemical process came from. So what I would do is I would say, okay, the first step of alchemy is X. And then I research all the different symbols and myths and things tied to that. And then from that mind map that I created, I would figure out what the crime was in the book. I so each of the so each of the books was kind of developing both um, her personality, but they're also developing you know, the, since the magic system is based on alchemy, each of the crimes and everything that's happening is tied to the alchemy too. But that took a lot of research into how alchemy works. Um, and then on the other side of the research was the police stuff. Um, I'm lucky, as I mentioned, my mom used to be one, so I could call her up and be like, so what's it like to face down a perp in a dark alley? And she could tell me. Um, but then I also did a, um, my city has a, a citizens police academy um, that I attended. It was like a six week long program and I'd go for three hours once a week and they'd bring in all the different departments and they talk about how they worked and it was very hands on. We got to, they actually brought drugs to class um, for us to like look at. They, you know, like locked us in. Yeah. And started passing <laughs> around like crack cocaine and big Ziploc bags full of pot and it was really great. Um, <laughs> and then they like checked us as we left, of course. Um, you know, but they had, um, they, we got to go drive. Um, my city has this big, like, um, 
SUV cop cars and we got to get in those and drive a speed course um, at like high, you know, top speeds, lights blaring. So you kind of got that adrenaline rush. I got to go on a ride along um, with a local officer uh, that I was with him from like seven o'clock at night till two in the morning. Um, and then after I did that, I went and, t- and did a program called Riders Police Academy. Mm-hmm. which is put on by a former cop who's now a writer, and he brings in local, state, and federal um, agents to teach workshops in how to write cops properly. Uh, um, you know, because there, is a lot of, there are a lot of um, liberties that authors take with policing and their stories. Um, and, you know, I certainly could take a lot of liberties because I'm writing about a world that doesn't really exist, but I wanted everything to have the ring of truth. Yeah. So even even when I have them investigating crimes using magic, I still needed to have the structure of how would, how would you know, a police officer actually work in this situation. So it was really, really fun research. Um, I got to do a lot of things that I wouldn't normally do. Um, so it was a lot of research, and I think that that comes through in the book. That um, oh, absolutely. That I had fun with it, but also that I I really took the time to learn, you know, what I could. So. Yeah, and um, I, I think uh, that the book is definitely stronger for because it uh, it's like I started reading Curse Moon recently, and it's like uh, the cops feel very real. It's like I have cop friends, and most some of them do talk like that. Um, with each other and it's it's just it's kind of uncanny and it's like now you can co- sort of pick out on whether it's on tv or books where they're you know the author or writer is just kind of making it up and they don't really know what cops sound like well some some that's because some writers rely on tv shows and books to figure out what cops are like and if you're not reading the right people you're gonna get the other thing too for me i think as far as the language goes um, not only being around police officers, but my father was a fireman, and so I kind of grew up around, you know, people in, you know, first responder situations, and so I grew up hearing how they told stories and how they talked to each other. There's a lot of gallows humor, um, you know, and I'm kind of fascinated by people who choose to go into those high-stress, kind of dangerous jobs, and I find, and I think being fascinated by them and wanting to learn about them is important and portraying them in a way that is um, honest. You know, they're not perfect people. Um, there's a lot of problems that are inherent in those institutions that you can't really shy away from, but you don't also want to say that's all it is. There are a lot of great things about it, too. So right. you have to bring a lot of empathy with you when you're writing any kind of character, and I think the way that you get empathy is you try and learn about them. Yeah. So, no, I think I think most of the the people that do that sort of thing want to do it for all the right reasons, is because they want to. I think what it boils down to is just they want to help people. Right. Yeah. Um, so it seems like you you have a fairly busy lifestyle with being an author. How do you uh, how do you um, balance keeping life and being an author? Uh, how do you keep that balance? Because so, I know a lot of people really struggle with that. Well, first of all, I'm very, very lucky in that I do write full time. Um, it would be a it would be a lot bigger challenge if I was juggling a full time job in writing um, and a family. But as it is, I you know I work from home. Um, I do have a son; he's about to be 14. Um, so it gets easier with him as he gets older because he's you know getting more and more independent. Um, but it is nice because I have the flexibility that if he has, you know, something at school or he's sick or something that I don't have to, that I can, you know, take a day and take care of that and then make it up in my word count if I'm behind. Um, I also have a really supportive family. My husband works full time outside the home and, you know, we, it was a lot of years of, you know, I'm leaving for, excuse me, I'm leaving for a week for a convention and he would either work from home or take time off. Um, so for me, the the key to the balance is is having family and friends who really support what I do, and they understand that it's a job. Um, you know, I think some people, um, I think some people think that 
being a writer is just kind of like sitting around in your pajamas playing make-believe, and it does feel that way sometimes, but it's kind of one of those things where you can have weeks at a time where you're not super busy, but then the crunch time comes, and you're writing 12, 14 hours a day, you're staying up all night to finish a book, then you've got to go to a convention, or, you know, a lot of book events happen over weekends, um, and I think people are like, oh, you're going on vacation, well, no, I'm, I'm working the whole weekend, so... It's kind of a different kind of job, and I think a lot of people can't really, you know, wrap their minds around what it really involves, but I I don't complain about it because I am, I mean, I love what I do, and I love that I don't have to go to an office every day, and, um, but the, I think the biggest, the biggest challenge when you work from home and you do it full time is balancing the writing with the business, because, um, you know, I can write, um, you know, it's it's making sure that you're, like, getting your words in first thing because then all the emails start coming in and you've got you've got to do your taxes and you've got to email your agent and, you oh, you've got a newsletter to put out. And, you, and, and so the hardest thing, actually, is turning it off at the end of the day and not obsessing about it because you can really become exactly. a workaholic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know early on and even still I burn myself out on it sometimes because I, I mean, it's when you're passionate about something, it's it's hard not to want to give it your all and pull all nighters all the time. But, you know, you can't run like that forever. Well, and burnout is a real thing. And I, I recently wrote this blog post um, about there's this funny dynamic that happens because, you know, I started writing 11 years ago. And I knew I wanted to get published, but really it was a way for me to like have a creative outlet. It was like, my son was small, he was about three. And so he'd go to bed and I would run outside and sit on my patio and write all night. And that was my time. Um, but then I got published and suddenly this thing that I did is kind of a hobby for fun became my work. And I didn't replace the fun escapist hobby. So I became this crazy workaholic where everything I did had to do with books. All, all my vacations were to book conventions. All my friends were writers. I wrote and I worked on the business pretty much nonstop for about six or seven years. And I got to the point where I was like, I have, like, it, like there's nothing that I do that's just for fun that doesn't have ego or income tied to it. And I burned out. And so I had to really you know, sorry, I really had to take a step back and say, you know, I need a hobby. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's important to, to take care of yourself because you, you'll, you'll burn out and start hating the thing that you started doing because you loved it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I know uh, I had to, I, I stopped going to the gym because I, I started writing so much and I was like, you know, I kind of need to get back into that because I was a, that was a hobby of mine, and then there's just, yeah, it's like you said, you get burned out on it, and right. people think they're immune to it, and it's uh, you're really not. Well, and what's hard is you'll go through periods where things aren't going so well, you know, you know, the book that you just had out, came out, d didn't do well, or nobody wants to buy your new book, and if all you have is your writing, and all, and it's so disappointing at that moment, then you're just going to be depressed because you don't have anything that brings like joy into your life. So it is important to have other things happening because I mean, you could really bring yourself to the ground if you're not careful. Absolutely. And on the subject of good and bad reviews, how do, how do you personally, well, what's your, uh, what's your fondest memory of a good review? And then how do you deal with negative reviews? memory of a good review was one that um, Paul Go Allen did for Redheaded Stepchild. Paul is he's been around forever and he used to run the Barnes and Noble Paranormal Fantasy Boards. Um, he reviews for Kirkus and Goodreads and he's kind of like one of the premier authors of Urban Fantasy and I remember he read Redheaded Stepchild and posted just this glowing review and he said, I was the next coming of um, Laurel K. Hamilton and, um, and Kim Harrison, um, which was such a big boost as a new writer to have that kind of legit.
legitimacy very early on, and I mean, it made me cry. I remember I was in a hotel room. I was at the RT book re- book convention, and I and I pulled it pulled it up and read it, and I just started sobbing. And it was <laughs> like, okay, I'm like really doing this. Like this is like this. I'm I'm like legit now, you know. Um, so that's a really wonderful review, and I I know Paul personally now, and we're good friends, and um, he's just been such a wonderful supporter of my career. Um, how do I handle bad reviews? Well, first of all, I try, I used to like have a Google search on my name and I don't do that anymore because, you know, you get a lot of bad news in your inbox that way. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I try to really be philosophical about it and I've been doing this for a long time, so I, it's definitely a skill I've had to, to learn and understand that, you know, my books aren't for everyone. Um, some people come expecting a different kind of book. Some people um, just don't connect with your voice and your subject matter. Um, you know, they're entitled to their opinion. The ones that are hard to digest are the ones that feel like personal attacks, um, where people people tend to treat you like you aren't human. Um and, you know, question things about who you are personally. I mean, I've been called a racist. I've been called uh, homophobic. I've been called a fat shamer. I, you know, all, you know, all these terrible names that carry a lot of weight to them. And um, so on one hand, I try and listen to that and have a real conversation with myself and say, okay, am I being closed-minded? You know, am I blind to some prejudices you know I talked to my friends about it said what did you think about this and I try and learn from it and do better next time but then there is a very small part of me you know that we all have which is like you know that really sucks um but the way you deal with it is you have a support system outside of the internet uh you don't ever want to go online (laughs) and vent about those things um you know it's it's just uh, it's it's a tough thing because the way I've described it before it is imagine if your performance review from the boss you hate was posted online for everyone to see. Yeah, that's what feel that's what having a bad review is like. Um, and the thing that I also learned is that bad reviews can still sell books. Uh, there are plenty of people who think that if you have mostly four and five star reviews that you paid for those and that it can't possibly be people who love your books that much. I mean, um, and so bad reviews are good too. Because I think, you know, I think about it like um, when I want to go book a hotel or something for a trip, I'll go online to Yelp or whatever and I'll read the reviews. And I am pretty good at saying, okay, that person had you know, posted that review just because they're impossible to please, or, hey, they have legitimate concerns. And I think most people these days have that ability um, to read a review and decide for themselves whether it's something they'd want to read. So, I don't know. I mean, it's a complicated thing, but it's it's part of the gig. Absolutely. Um, and you just kind of roll with it and understand that for as you know, and the thing is, you tend to, you could have 20 great reviews and one bad one, and you're only going to focus on the bad one. So you, but you have to try and, you know, like have a talk with yourself and say, okay, you know, that person isn't my audience. But I do have an audience, and that's, that's the important thing, so. Yeah, and I think uh, authors deal with that a lot, too, and so do directors and a- actors. Ben Affleck was casted as Batman there's a lot of internet backlash about it and now he absolutely knocked the role out of the park i think most people agree that he was the best one of the best things about the the batman vs superman movie and i think i think audiences jumped the guns uh, jumped the gun on both movies books tv shows whatever well i think that there there's a culture online of um just being very pessimistic in general uh, it's almost like entertainment to complain about things, and I get, I get it, you know. But, yeah. Um, you, you, as a creator, you really have to keep that in mind and try and limit your exposure to that because um, it can really get in your head. 
and um, you have to kind of protect your time when you're creating and not let that get in inside your head and psych you out from doing things. Um, you know, I mean, it's just it's just part of the it's just part of it. You, you know, you have to kind of look out for yourself and protect your writing as much as you can. Yeah, and it's, it, it helps to remind yourself that uh, you're doing something that takes a lot of courage that a lot of people, it's like, you know, they just work mundane jobs all the time and they don't want to put any effort to do anything that they care about. So I, I think it takes well, a lot of courage. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to say they don't care about things. They just aren't creators. And um, so they, they don't really understand the work involved. You know, they just want their stories and they want them to be good and they want to be entertained and you know, I get that, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a real misconception about how much work's actually involved. Um, I recently, my, my own family, I recently graduated from uh, graduate school after two and a half years, and the first thing that my sister said to me was, are you going to get a job now, or are you just going to keep writing? Uh, and, you know, she just doesn't understand. I mean, she doesn't, she hasn't read my books. She doesn't buy my books. Um, she doesn't know I'm a USA Today bestseller. She doesn't know I've won awards for my writing. You know, we're just, it, it, it's just, uh, and that's my own blood. So I can't expect, you know, somebody who um, doesn't even know me personally necessarily to be like, are you okay? Do you feel fulfilled by your work? You know, like, yeah. I have to just find fulfillment in doing it. No, it's not always easy, though. You're right. Um people just there are people that just don't get it and there there are some that you know they don't get it but they're like you know what you're chasing your dream so it's if you know what you're doing then just go for it right uh so i kind of want i like i always like to close these sort of things with with three fun questions that kind of do and don't have to do with writing uh is that okay sure so do you prefer black and white films or color films color mm -hmm. i think i think most would all like a psychology test or you no <laughs> no <laughs> no uh i don't know it's just, it's just something that popped into my head i was like oh that that's an interesting one i could ask um you write i you write a lot of vampire stuff what would your take on a werewolf book be Uh huh. Um, I guess it'd probably be something like that. Like my friend Molly Harper writes this great um, series with uh, Jeanette Batista, where the werewolves are like the mob, you know, the family. Uh, I think that would be a fun, fun approach to it. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so if Kate Prospero and Sabina Kane met for coffee one day, what do you think they would talk about? Yeah. Um, they might talk about uh, their favorite weapons or <laughs> um, maybe magic, you know, because Kate's a recovering wizard and um, Sabina is kind of, was kind of new to the whole magic world, so maybe they'd complain about it, you know, like getting, getting together and like, you know, comparing battle stories. Yeah, uh, mine's way yeah. worse than yours. That, that's probably how exactly. it would go. Exactly. Um, any chances of a crossover? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I, I mean, the worlds are really different, so it'd be kind of hard to, to mesh them. Although, I will say this. Um, on Tuesday, I have an anthology. I'm in an anthology that's coming out called Urban Allies, where they took 20 urban fantasy authors, and they paired us up, and we wrote crossover stories. So I wrote a story with Caitlin Kittredge from her Hellhound um series where it's Ava from her Hellhound series and Leo who's a Reaper and Sabina Kane and Adam and Gagool from my series and they meet up in New Orleans and have they're hunting a guy down. I didn't know when we started writing that story if it was gonna work, but I think it turned out really, really well. Um, so it's possible. Now that I've done it once, I think it is possible. But um, I don't know. It's an interesting question. 
I I mean, as as somebody who enjoys your writing, I think it would be really cool. I I haven't had the chance to read the Sabina Kane series, but I have. I, but I I intend to because I've loved Dirty Magic so much. You're welcome. Um, any future projects you want to tell us about? Well, I'm kind of in a weird spot right now because um, I have a book on submission, uh, which is one that I wrote as part of my MFA program, uh, my thesis novel. Um, and it's very different. It's actually Appalachian Gothic, which is, um, it's a, the premise is basically, it's a small town in Southern Virginia where there's kind of a demon who lives in a coal mine um, who gets released on this town. Um, and it's got a lot of things that my writing is known for, you know, strong female character who's trying to find her place in the world. Um, but it's a much more like character driven, not literary at all, but kind of upmarket writing style. Um, so anyway, I, I'm waiting to see if anybody will bite on that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just working on a couple of other fun projects um, to keep myself out of trouble. <laughs> um, so we'll see. Yeah, we, we authors are, we're a troubled group. We have uh, imaginary friends for a living. Yeah. Well, I always say if I'm not putting drama on the page, I create it in my room. So <laughs> I try and keep it on the page. <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank I want to thank you for joining me today. Um, everybody who's listening, make sure you follow Jay on Twitter. And um, she's also got a YouTube channel. I'll post links to her her channel, her Twitter page, her, her, uh, her what else do you have? Do you have everything. it? Every, everything? <laughs> Facebook. Um, I'm sure you've got an internet page, too. Okay, well, make sure you check out her books. Her books are, are freaking amazing. I uh, I love the Dirty Magic books. Uh, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you.